Hey there, Film Buds. Welcome back to the Film Buds podcast. I'm your host, Paul. And I'm Lauren. Uh, and welcome to episode 240. Woohoo! Which also now, at this point, officially marks, like, pretty much completely one full year of hosting the Film Buds. Yay! We did it! Um... September was my first, like, full month at the helm mm-hmm. a year ago, and, and now here we are. Yes. Um, I do have an episode uh, coming up with Henry. Uh, I need to do the editing for it. I've been very busy. Uh, but we do, you know, it, it's been such an interesting journey. Um, we're also right in the middle of Hispanic Heritage uh, Month as well. Well, not in the middle. We're at the end of Hispanic Heritage Month. It is the actual Hispanic Heritage Month season still because it starts in mid-september and goes to mid-october yes but here on the film buds we dedicate it all of september and so since this is the last friday of september uh we're also wrapping up hispanic hispanic heritage month here on the show yep the quarter is ending (laughs) yes uh (laughs) but uh i guess with all of that said how do you feel about one year of the film buds? Um, wow. You know, I guess I feel like I should be, you know, on a on a stage with a trophy. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I wish. Um, no, I, I feel good. Um, I remember a year ago being more nervous, you know, on on the film buds and... You know, just about the idea of being recorded, I guess, and people listening to what I'm saying later while they're doing chores or driving to work. And, you know, um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it now. (laughs) I've accepted my, my place in the universe, um, as a, as a critic of, um, you know, this, this one thing. And I've, I've, I'm, I'm having a good time. Honestly, I really, I've, I've loved watching movies with you. We, we always watch movies anyways, anyways, and we always have these chats anyways. So it was just, you know, two birds, one stone. Um, you know, you needed a co-host and here I am, your right hand man. Bada boom. In all things. (laughs) That's right. That's right. In life. Um, (laughs) Well, it, it, it funnily enough dawned on me today, you know, I'm, I'm approaching 30. Um, and so I've now known you for half my life. Oh my gosh. Yes. Wow. Um, Isn't so that yeah, fun? You are, you are my right hand man in all things. Yeah. Um, Jazz hands happened. And I very much have enjoyed this journey. Um, It's, you know, it's been a lot of hard work, but I always enjoy doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, lately I haven't been as, uh, you know, active in certain aspects of it, I suppose. Um, but that's also, you know, just because of, of the balance of, of life and, and doing a podcast on the side and that sort of thing. Um but I always enjoy doing this show. Like, it always brings me a lot of joy and a lot of satisfaction. Um, and I always enjoy getting to go and sort of, you know, put together this really interesting watch list. You know, it, it it's, you know, the sort of monthly playlist uh, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I really enjoy that aspect of it. Um, and it's it's really broadened... You know, it's given me a good excuse to just sort of broaden my own uh, viewscape, you know, if you will. Which is which is a hilarious concept to me, <laughs> considering the amount of movies that we that we live in a room filled with on a regular basis. You know, that are that are ninety percent yours. You know, um, and I'm I'm not being generous with that ninety, like. I maybe have less than 10%. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) I've never actually counted the ones that I technically purchased myself. Um, 
But like, you know, the idea that you are still ever expanding your your knowledge of movies, for me, you know, the, the land of musicals is a smaller number. And I think that that for, you know, Scape, it's just it, movies feel like almost never ending of of the possibilities, you know, which is which is fun. You know, it, it keeps us in business as well, which is yeah. which is great. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, with with all the things that, you know, the, the fact that there's still room in your brain to fill more information is 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 such a fun, such a fun thing to watch. Well, uh, you know, to to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, G.I. Joe. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it was one thing, you know, in college, you know, high school to college definitely expanded, you know, where I met Henry, expanded uh, my knowledge base, but it's been good to have this show to really give me something dedicated to go back to and and uh and and force me to relearn and and grow in all those ways because once you really realize that you know um film is just in the short amount of time this is i guess sort of what it is to a degree in the short amount of time that film has started as an art form mm mm-hmm. mhm it has also so explosively expanded um, mm-hmm. and redefined itself in so many different ways. And, and, and visual media has become so much a part of... Audiovisual media has become so much a part of our day-in, day-out existence um, that when you look at the history of it and then apply that to a global aspect... Mm-hmm. It's it's truly like the most explosive art form of the last century. Well, it really is because of its ex- ex- accessibility, mm-hmm. um, just of the medium itself. You know, it was it's, anyone can pick up a camera. Anyone can pick up a camera, and going to the movies doesn't cost you a dime. Pretty much, you know, mm-hmm. is the thing. Whereas, like theater, it, it takes a lot longer. It takes a lot more resources, and you it need is the stage. Yeah, and it is an expense on the audience to to experience. You know, it is supposed to be this kind of like rich experience. You know, this is something that you don't do very often. Where going to the movies, you can go to the movies every day if you want, if mm-hmm. you if you can uh, if you can afford that lifestyle, you know. Um, so if of every day, that's three hundred and sixty five new movies that like, you know, need to need to populate the airwaves, and especially now with with streaming, it it makes it even easier. There's, it's it's an ever expanding to your point. It's an explosive. Um, medium where the possibilities are truly endless um and and there are also you know vast variations of the of the same concepts but you know at the end of the day we keep going back to them because as an audience they are familiar they are comforting and uh, they are also ever evolving as well um which is which is only to be done in film. Mm-hmm. It would take... We would never see where theater could go to this expanse. Because it, it just takes too long. Yeah. You know, this is... We've got a hundred years worth of, of theater years Well, and again, it's room. also just the literal physical limits, you know, of it. No, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, with that said... Uh, let's get on with actually doing some proper film budsing. Yes, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> so we came here to talk about uh, our final Hispanic heritage film, uh, El Norte, uh, which came out back in 1983. This is one that I hadn't heard of. Um, and it was only restored uh, a few years ago. Um which I thought was particularly interesting. You know, they had the whole title card about it. Um, But we'll get to the movie in general in a little bit. Um, It's a fascinating movie, though. You know, I wanted to 
really make sure uh, in Film Buds that we tried to touch on some different things, and we did end up really getting into a lot of uh, Mexican-Hispanic heritage uh, in a lot of the films that we did this month. You know, we started with um, uh, Guillermo del Toro, uh, who is a Mexican-American, or um, a Mexican filmmaker. He works in America, um, even though that movie was about the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and then we had, uh, you know, E2 Mama Tambien. Uh, then we moved on over into um, uh, Ruben Salazar, Man in the Middle. Um, and uh, that's, of course, about a Mexi- Mexican-American man. And so with our last two films, we actually really started to travel into uh, this very specific niche of um, native and indigenous, uh, cultures in, uh, Central and South America. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, last week we did Retablo, uh, which was about, you know, uh, Quechua people. Uh, and here we, we traveled into, uh, Guatemala. Uh, and so last week was Peru. Yeah, so, we've really, we've really been, you know, we've been exploring the landscape. Yeah. Uh, and so it was, it's been a really, really interesting month. And I guess, um, before we get too far into this film in specific, uh, how did you feel about, um, finishing off, you know, Hispanic heritage with these two films that focused very particularly on, um, these indigenous cultures that are, that are also tied to the Hispanic, uh, experience? Loved it. Loved it. I love learning new things. Um, and this, these two movies in particular were, were, um, exploring something that I had never gone down before. I'd never, um, you know, the, the, the fly paper of my life, it is, it had never stuck to it before. And this was my, my first experience with these, these concepts, um, Really, because at the end of the day, I think that my my South American history needs some some updating, mm-hmm. um, and I need to 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 educate myself more more thoroughly. I think on on South America and and the the history, the vast history that is South America, other than the fact that there were you know an, ancient people that lived there, and now they are are not. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so, but this was just fascinating to, um, it, it also, you know, because the histories are so close mm-hmm. to us in the modern time as well. Um, you know, it's very graspable, really, really understandable, really, really digestible as a, as a, as a viewer. Um, and no, I really just, I, I love a good, I love a good lesson and I want to, I want to go down this further because there were things about these films that I didn't understand that I would like to understand more thoroughly just because I don't understand the politics of what's going on in these areas Mm -hmm. and what, what had been to where we are now. No, I totally get that. Um, not for a full, full blown history lesson because definitely a lot of it is, is pretty complicated. Um, but I wanted to touch on two things that I actually, uh, one was one that I was doing in something related to something else. One is something that I looked up for this in particular. Okay. okay. Um, the first thing was, you know, there is a history immediately, you know, sort of from the get um, of Western European civilization interaction with Central and South America and, of course, North America. Um, immediate conflict tension, um, you know, violence, uh, and one of the, the great examples of that is a book that you and I have recently been reading, uh, that I definitely recommend for people, uh, Bananas book, I swear. A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Uh, it's a fascinating book that essentially begins with Columbus, uh, coming to Haiti and Cuba and uh, Hispaniola 
uh, and committing a genocide. And then we move on all the way to uh, the Clinton administration. And so I bring this up because it's, again, this example of there used to be a people that are no longer here. Mm -hmm. And it's this uh, influence of Western European culture into, you know, a native land that ultimately resulted in, through all sorts of tactics, uh, all of them, you know, horrifying, uh, the entire, uh, you know, loss of a, of a, of a culture. Um, and it's, it's very gripping stuff. I highly recommend that you pick up the book and read it. Um, I, I, I couldn't possibly do it justice without like just starting to quote it and, um, and we then I'll just get here. carried away. We would be so, here for, for all night. He would just start to read it, But essentially, it, you know, that's that's sort of the, the summation of it. And it's it then, of course, ties into later on, you know, you were talking about the history of, of Central and South America. And pretty much even since America uh, got going in earnest, eventually we started to also turn our, our interest toward Central and South America. Um you know, you start with things like the Mexican, uh, American war, you know, and, and, uh, the annexation of Texas and, and that whole very complicated thing. Um, and then eventually you move all the way on into the 20th century. And in 1954, amongst, uh, you know, a whole movement of, very, you know, deep-rooted government policy, um, the CIA decided to go and uh, depose a democratically elected leader in Guatemala, and it led to a dictatorship. Fun, fun. And that was a, a very common MO, if you go and look into United States history, especially in relation to the CIA, um, and some of the other alphabet organizations, there is a, a history of deposing people, getting involved with Central and South America, with people, uh, exploiting people, excuse me, uh, people, resources, um, and, you know, getting in bed with things like cartels you know, and fueling some of the whole drug uh, war crisis. That's why they and... just skip right over that in in school. Mm -hmm. they, we really don't focus on South America past a point in its own purpose. Yeah. It's because it gets very messy. Uh, and this is a part of that history. And so in a sort of summation, again, very quickly, uh, the CIA sanctioned a deposition of a government in the 50s, which led to a dictatorship. By the 60s, uh, leftist rebel groups in especially rural areas started to rise up. Mm -hmm. And it led to a 36-year-long civil war. Wow, really? Mm -hmm. Wow, and we're over here boasting about our civil war. From 1960... Onward, there was a 36-year-long civil war, which is the context, right, of where we find El Norte. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. The, see, this is, this is what I needed. This is, exactly, this is exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> and so, um, I guess with that said, we should go ahead and get going. Yes, dive on in. Uh, El Norte came out in 1983. It's rated R. It's two hours and 21 minutes. It is directed by Gregory Nava, uh, who also came up with the story. And then it is uh, written by Anna Thomas. Uh, it stars Zaid Silvia Gutierrez as Rosa and David Villalpando as Enrique. 
Uh, and the premise is after their family is killed in a government massacre, brother and sister Enrique and Rosa flee Guatemala and embark on a perilous journey to El Norte, the United States. And with that said, dear, what did you think of El Norte? This this movie was like was like watching like a Shakespeare or 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 an opera you know without 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 singing you know it it had these these acts that it was broken up into which i which i loved i loved the 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 headers being our locations pretty much you know we start in in the village and then we move to um this journey that they go on and then we end in los angeles and I think that that's fantastic. I think I, it was very clear what was happening with them. Um, and they were almost like curtain breaks. Um, and I also, I really loved the fact that this movie um, had a lot of interesting visuals when it came to the, the camera work and the storytelling. You know, it was, it was very, it was, it was another movie where even if I didn't know the language, I feel like I would still understand what was happening on the screen just by just by watching it alone, which was which was really nice. Um, so since I don't speak Spanish or the 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 Indian language that they speak in um, in the film that I do not know the name of at the moment, um, but. I, I really just I thought that this movie was was a fascinating journey as well. I love looking at um, different cultures and exploring that through through I you know a medium that I feel is is a trustworthy lens into that. You know I felt like this was very honest in how these people actually are. Um, I loved looking at the fact that even though they had their their cultural identity, they still were steeped in Catholicism, and that was, there were symbols of that everywhere in the film. You know, even in the, the outskirts of Guatemala, you know, Christianity still, still had a hold, which I, which is, it's such a fascinating thing of how, how far, you know, something can truly, truly spread and, and truly bring us together, but not really. Um, but then this journey that this 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 these siblings take is is one that is unlike any other that we've seen even in this month we we've, we've seen a lot of movies that are journey movies um this month and i feel like that's a common theme in a lot of the hispanic films that we have seen um but i just i think that everyone is is a different different narrative you know, this is this truly loving family unit that is just being broken apart by by war and by prejudice, and is they they go on this journey to to the north, and this is their entire story of from the, basically the moment like this moment before things go bad. You know, this this sweet moment where we get to meet everybody, the household when everything is perfect still, and then slowly each thing gets 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 ripped away and there are trials that these 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 children honestly they're they're like young adults have to take and it it reminded me a lot of like the land you know these these really harsh environments and then the uh, the fact that they were still so optimistic was just like just a lovely way to to like keep it going you know as well you know, even even when they finally you know, after all these trials make it to the States, you know, and there's still trials, you know, and things aren't working out the way that they thought. And, but there's still, there's still so much hope and there's still things to, to celebrate. And I, I loved the, the moment when they go and get into the, the really crappy apartment that they get. And it's, it's awful looking like there's, it looks like, you know, it's a dive, you know. Yeah, crap stains on the walls and stuff like it looks it looks so terrible, but like they're still marveling at the fact that there is electricity and that Running the toilet water. yeah, the, the the toilet flushes and 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 that's just like something that they've, you know, never experienced before in their in their hometown in in Guatemala and the fact that that was still like a blessing 
even though it wasn't the conditions that they were expecting. And I just, I really, I really enjoyed this movie a lot. It it has a lot of like, truly, truly beautiful moments, um, truly tender moments as well, with our with our leads. That is 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 really refreshing. Um, this movie goes to a lot of a lot of sore spots and like. But it, it's it's a safe movie, but it's it's definitely it, it touches on a lot of things that are, are very necessary to to be talked about, but in a, in a very safe and comforting way, I think like I think that our, our characters are really likable, you know, just think just crappy things keep happening to them. No, for sure. Um, this movie, um, you know, going into it. I didn't necessarily have a lot of particular expectation. Um, and as it got going, you know, I was, I was pretty immediately hooked into it and it's, it's not long, long, but two hours, 21 is not short. No. Um, and so when we hit an hour in, I was pretty amazed at how quickly that hour had gone by. Uh, it's broken up. The movie is structured into, into three parts. Uh, uh, the first part is named after their father. Mm-hmm. The second part is the coyote. Yes. And the third part is, uh, El Norte. Uh, when they finally, you know, have, have arrived in, uh, America. And, um... They all three take on, you know, some... They they each have their own very specific sort of beginning points and end points that also cohesively go on to create this arcing, you know, sort of narrative journey for our siblings. What I was really so impressed by with this movie, honestly, was at a certain point while we were watching it, I was like, I bet this thing is considered, like, one of the top-notch adaptations of a novel. Mm-hmm. And there's no novel. Oh, I can I can see why where, where you would think that there would be like a novel. It is it is very like grippingly dramatic, and it's so rich, and um, you know it has again that that um, kind of like um, depth to it, you know, and that likability to it. I think you know, and it's so well structured. Mm-hmm. You know, to your point of of getting us into the family and their struggle and creating that likability, and it's also so classically literary. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a perfect sort of Greek tragedy setup. Yeah, I was thinking like um, the Joy Luck Club. You know, the mm-hmm. fact that that is definitely based off of a book, mm-hmm. and there's you know stripping with things happening, but like this didn't this didn't have that. You know. Yeah. Um, and so. I found this movie really, really phenomenal. Um, to your point, our, our two main leads, um, Rosa and Enrique, are engrossing people. Um, and it's fascinating to watch them go on this journey where they make really tough decisions and really hard sacrifices, and um, and it never gets better and seeing how they respond to that reality um that you know they're the and and they're kind of hitting you know i don't know exactly how old they're supposed to be but she's young enough that like she's only just now seriously dating um you know and so I'm thinking that they're probably late teens. Yeah, I was thinking that she was probably still, I guess, in that high school range mm-hmm. of being like maybe she was was just eighteen, you mm-hmm. know, and and now she can she can start. To and he was maybe twenty. Yeah, you know. And um, it's this really, really brutal, you know, sort of coming of age story where, where life just ends up hitting them like a brick, you know, um, time after time after time. And even though they meet good people along the way, 
life itself never relents. And it is very, again, classically structured, classically literary in its base narrative form of setup and payoff, of giving and taking, you know, of, of providing olive branches and taking them away from our characters and um, in giving them doorways and options that allow them to make right and wrong calls. Um, but I think what's also really a great stand about, uh, a standout aspect of the movie is I think it has a lot of the same sort of, for me, melodrama and, but also, um, otherworldly quality of certain elements of like, uh, the Frida film, Mm -hmm. uh, where Mm -hmm. they also really play with like, her art and stuff, yeah. And and in hyping up a moment. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. um, one of the moments for me that really stands out is the moment of when they finally see an American city. And we get this great big bombastic score, you know, with these aerial shots of the city, you know, just this oh, real yeah. grand... And it's not even like, it's, where, where were they? They weren't even in, they were in like San that Diego. Was, yeah. Yeah, it was like they were really just like hyping up San Diego. Yeah, and it's just this pounding drum that you hear. Yeah, or the when she when she looks at the the women that come into the um I guess it was like a like a dry cleaners, you know, um an alterations place where where she's working and and she's just like in awe mm-hmm. of them and there's this like huge moment about these these women that are just like perfect you know, to her, like, models. Yeah, and, you know, again, the otherworldly quality also of, um, like, the the old women that you you mm-hmm, never mm-hmm. see, you know, like, when you're looking for them. No, oh, yeah, and the fact that they were just kind of there calling out to her, you know, this... this... But also the door shuts to their home mm-hmm. as well, you know? It's, um... It has this really fascinating, constantly throughout it, um, otherworldly quality, um, again, that touches, like, like we talked about, um, the, the magical realism element, um, Mm -hmm. so at play in, um, in so many of the films that we've watched this month Mm -hmm. is so very prevalent here in this film. Um, and as far as the context for it, uh, politically... You know, that dictatorship, that civil war, is what ultimately ruins their lives. Um, Because it's only because these people feel that they have to rise up that they end up getting targeted by the army, by Mm -hmm. the military branch of this dictatorship that ultimately results in their family getting um, butchered. And, uh, you know, it's... What was also really so uh, striking about this film for me that was the, oh wow, it went that far, um, was the the digging up of the the dead. You know, they couldn't even have peace. The military came in, took away everyone, including the bodies, you know, they took away all sort of sign of these people as best as they could. Mhm. I mean it was a it was a it was an eradication, mm-hmm. you know. Um cuz I assumed that they were they weren't taking those women to do anything, you know, wholesome with them. No. Uh and then they they arrive in America and again going back to set up and pay off, you know. My my father always said that, you know, Uh, The rich only saw us as strong arms. And then one of the last, um, you know, spoken lines that we hear from uh, Enrique is, you know, I have strong arms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's so well done, but also going back to how it's, it's such a different movie than some of the other ones that we've seen. It's a radically different movie, of course, than, like, La Misma Luna. Uh, Under the Same Moon. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, 
is the, you know, this lovely story of a mother uh, and her son, you know, torn apart and eventually being reunited. Yeah, yeah, and this kind of, like... And we never get to see how life was probably still hard once they were together, but at least they were together. Yes. And here we kind of have at least some of that similar texture of life is hard, but they are together. Um... But even that doesn't necessarily have the same satisfaction. Like, this movie is just oftentimes um, tragic. Mm-hmm. No, honestly. Um, but I think that it's it's a very beautiful story. Um, and it's it's very much worth a watch, for sure. For, for really anybody who is, who is game. Yeah. Some, for for an interesting interesting dive into a completely different culture, a, d- a completely different perspective. Um, I think that the acting is is truly phenomenal. It's heartbreaking. I there were times when watching um, Enrique where I was like, this guy's going too hard right now. You know, I was like, everybody else is like giving me like, you know, this is just a normal day, and homie was like crying, and I was like, wow, just just. It, just I couldn't I couldn't get enough you know I was I was intoxicated by this 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 film well and um you know I talked about the the sort of unworld qualities of it but it also to your point um when we first watched it you were you you first saw some of the footage and you were like is this a documentary mm-hmm. um I think that also speaks to the very even though there are some other worldly visuals there's also just this real raw, um, almost, you know, 70s, you know, and yeah, this is early 80s, which is kind of late 70s, cinema verite sort of quality to it, not unlike Altman with M.A.S.H., you know, just this raw presentation of life, Mm -hmm. um, of people, of how it is. No, yeah, because it kind of felt like B-roll of something where somebody went somewhere and filmed some stuff and they put it in the background of their film, you know? Mm-hmm. It, it and felt that, too real. And that even applies moving all the way into, you know, their journey through Mexico. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it. the bus feels like it's stacked with, you know, people that aren't there to be filmed but are legitimately on a journey you know it, yeah oh um, my gosh you know, that bus i i mm-hmm. was not expecting that bus to just pull onto the side of the road and just like everybody all right we're gonna go to nap nap now we're gonna go to sleep tonight and i just just such a foreign thing to me you know i've i've also never been on an overnight bus before so maybe maybe we also do that in the states so i don't know um but i was just that was just crazy you know just no kept, for sure just kept the lights on was snapping on the road um, no, absolutely. Um, so I guess, uh, if you had to rate, uh, El Norte, what would you give it? Oh, I think this movie is a five out of five. Um, I really just thought that this, it was, I couldn't look away from it. And, and you mentioned earlier, you know, the, the time of the movie, um, two hours, 20 minutes, is not like the longest film we've ever watched, but it's definitely not something that you like go into when you're like got a time thing, you know, you if you watch this movie when you've got all the time in the world. Yeah, when you've got 2 hours and 20 minutes. Yeah, you know, and I it just breezed past because I was just so in it. I was I was I couldn't look away from this movie one because I don't know I, I, half of the mo- more than a t- Two thirds of this movie was not in English, so I couldn't look away just to understand it because I was reading the entire time. But also, just it was just I didn't want to stop watching this movie, mm-hmm. you know. And I never felt like anything that ever happened on their journey felt out of place. Um, yes, that's a fair point. Sometimes on movies like this, you know, you can you're like. And then really, like, it just We keeps, crank the stakes too high. Yeah, it just keeps getting ridiculously out of whack. And um, I just, I think that this movie was really connected to to, to the honesty of what this, this life could look like. No, for sure. 
Um, I'll go with a four and a half. Okay. Uh, I think it's absolutely tremendous. I really don't, um, you know, I think that there are a few moments where, um, I honestly just thought it was a novel because I was honestly like, I bet that gets better explained in the book. (laughs) Um, but for, for the most part, honestly, like it's a, it's a tremendous movie and I think it's, um, it's definitely, I think a must watch at least once, you know, um, Mm -hmm. for, for everyone. Uh, it's a, a gripping, sweet, tender, um, very, very, uh, oftentimes heartbreaking movie where, where people make the choice that, that you absolutely know that they shouldn't. Um, and it has the exact consequence that you know that it's going to have. Mm -hmm. And, and it's still heartbreaking all the same. And I think that that's definitely where the movie has some of its absolute power. Mm -hmm. No, this movie is dramatic, but like in the best kind of way. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on, uh, I wanted to, uh, talk about a few things. Of course, we recently had a, a trailer come out for the Neil Druckmann, uh, Last of Us television, a television series for, uh, HBO. Mm -hmm. What did you think? Um, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. It's just the game. It's... And I mean, maybe it's because you literally just finished a playthrough of the game, like, I don't know, two weeks ago or something like that now. But the game is very fresh in my mind. So we watched that and I was like, I know where that is. I know what that is. I know who that is. I know what that is. I know what that is. I know what that is. <laughs> and I guess, I guess that's what, you know, true Star Wars fans feel like watching anything that Disney puts out nowadays, where they're like, ugh. Gosh, it must be really nice to be up on the know, you know? Oh, my gosh. Um, it looks fine. No, I think you that's You know, fair. um, I'm gonna just, it was, it was really just like a teaser. Yeah. Other than like little blips. We, we didn't even really get to hear anyone speak. Yeah, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have to see them do it. I can't just see people looking stoically in profile and at the camera and at things And then see a clicker and go, oh, art, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to need a little bit more baiting because at the end of the day, um, I've seen the art, I've I've played the art. I've not, I've not actually, that's a lie. I've not actually played the art. I've seen, I've seen the art played before me and I think that it's totally good as it is, you know, but I also understand, you know, expanding the, the scope of, of, Of who can access it. No, I get that. Um, In a bit of uh, very tragic news, uh, the rapper Coolio is uh, passed away at the age of 59. Wait, what? Yeah, Coolio. Yeah. Like today? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, I did not know this. Yeah, the news broke uh, earlier today that Coolio passed away. Yeah, oh my gosh. No, I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, uh, quite the shame, honestly. Uh, cause of death is currently still not known, uh, at least as of this recording. Um, but it's a, it's a real shame. I remember, I remember Coolio, uh, he did the, uh, the opening theme song for All That. Oh my god! If I'm not mistaken, or was it Keenan and Kel? It was I think Ke- it, I think it was Keenan and Kel. Mm-hmm. Uh... And, uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, it's a real shame. And I, of course, grew up listening to Gangster's Paradise as well, um, (laughs) as one did, uh, back in the burbs, (laughs) (laughs) once upon a time, uh, but also just 59 is tragically young. No. Yeah. Honestly. That's just, that's far, far, far too young. Yeah. You're supposed to be like a hundred. Yeah, you know, and ideally, I suppose, if you want to, I guess, make it that far. I mean, um, that's, that. I feel like that's everybody's goal, and, like, you know, the closer you get to it, the more you win. Was, um, Godard recently, uh, 
passed away via um, medically assisted suicide. I'm not sure who we're talking Jean-Luc about. Jean-Luc Godard, the, uh, the French New Wave filmmaker. Is this, this is something that happened recently? Yeah, he, he recently chose to, um, he was, he was done. He was older, you know, I mean, he was an active filmmaker in the 60s. Uh, he was, I think, in his 80s at this point. Um, and, uh, and, and he decided that it was time. Fascinating. That sounds like, like the, like the premise to a sci-fi movie that's coming out this fall. Um, well, or you can just go and look up some information on the real life story of Jack Kevorkian, I suppose. I mean, yeah, but I was thinking more of like a I am robot deal. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, no, that makes more sense. <laughs> uh, a bicentennial man, sort of. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, with Robin Williams. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I see where you're at with that. Uh, there was another little bit of uh, of movie news that I was going to bring up, and it's honestly escaped me because I didn't write it down. Um, always got to write things down. I do always got to write things down. Um, is what happens when you have a note outside of what's been already previously written down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> get a different, get a bigger notebook. No, that's, you just got to attach it, you know, sticky notes. Um, oh, that's fair. That's fair. I do that all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's pretty much all that I have for y'all. Um, if you are, you know, affected by the hurricane, I hope that y'all are all safe out there. Uh, if you are listening to this and the hurricane is happening around you, uh, I hope that you are listening to this in a safe place. Um, and if you are not, get somewhere safe. Um, that's an order from the film buds. Um... That's right, and that's that's serious. You better you better heed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and beyond that, you know, definitely be mindful. You know, if you're in the path of the storm, you know, um, try only to go out for necessary things, that sort of thing. Um, that's about all that I have, dear. Do you have anything that you would like to say to the listeners? I mean, you thoroughly, you thoroughly covered the the stay safe. Um, I liked it. I liked it. Um, while staying safe, and if you have power, you know, turn on, turn on something that you you haven't watched in a while. You know, take a take a cozy day, have something, have a have a good time, staying in. Because guess what? It's Friday. Yeah. You made it. You made it to the end of the week. High five yourself and have a beer on me. Mm. <laughs> so, um. Do not send us a bill. We will not. <laughs> we will not. We will, we will not. We will not reimburse you. We want you to email the film buds, but we do not want you to email us your bill uh, for the beer. We will not, we will not, uh, reimburse you that invoice. Uh, but, but it will help us know that you do know how to spell filmbuds at Mm gmail.com. The filmbuds podcast at gmail.com. Yep. Yep. What he said. (laughs) Uh, but with that said, of course, follow us also on social media. Um, check out last week's episode. Check out. All of our Hispanic Heritage uh, episodes. Yes. Um, we've we've done, of course, quite a few this month, but then we also have two that we did last year. Um, and also, let's get ready, y'all. We're about to be in spooky season officially. It's October. Woo! Woo! Uh, so uh, get ready for, you know, some, some horror-related Film Buds content starting next Friday. I mean, horror-related every month, but specifically in Halloween. Yeah. October. Halloween season. Halloween ooh, ooh, season. Ooh, ooh. It's the best holiday of the of the holiday sandwich that is the end of the year. No, that's fair. And uh, that's just about all that we have for you guys. Uh, stay safe. Keep listening. Be on the lookout for the upcoming Henry episode. And, uh, yeah. Take it easy, guys. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye.